Hola amigos, soy Francisco Rodríguez Aguirre, presidente de Smart Speakers, el principal buró de conferencistas de Latinoamérica, y me acompaña mi amigo Ricardo. ¿Cómo están? Buenas tardes, buenas noches, buenos días, donde nos estén viendo. Mi nombre es Ricardo Magaña, ahora como CEO de ACNOW, Meeting Planner, aquí en el programa 18 Minutos de... Estamos prácticamente, ya no me acuerdo en cuál, de qué edición vamos, pero vamos felices y contentos con nuestros eh, invitados de lujo que tenemos hoy, mi querido Francisco. Sí, y pues este, damos también la bienvenida a nuestros amigos de MPI y de Mundo Ejecutivo. Y tenemos un gran invitado el día de hoy, él es Michael Walsh. Él es uno de los grandes futuristas a nivel mundial. Es autor del bestseller El Líder Algorítmico, hablando de los algoritmos. Escribe mensualmente en la revista Harvard Business Review. Y Mike, it's a pleasure to have us with us. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, what are the three main trends that you see in the business world? Uh, for me, the three biggest trends right now are AI, decentralization, and the metaverse. Uh, so if we talk about those, firstly, AI, I think after the pandemic, a lot of the more traditional ideas around digital transformation have just become standard practice business. So the question is now, how do we leverage automation, algorithms, and artificial intelligence to do more than just cut costs, but to really reimagine what we can do? Decentralization, another big idea that came from the world of cryptocurrencies, but in a time of great uncertainty, I think companies are now trying to think about how they can have less central control and more agile, adaptable business units and, of course, supply chains. And the third and probably the most interesting uh, theme this year, I think, is metaverse, which is how do we unlock the true potential of the new virtual and augmented reality worlds to not only create new interfaces for customers, but to unlock new business value and new ways of doing business as well. Mike, I know that you are a special keynote speaker a long time ago in Presential, and right now you are in Istanbul right now. We are talking from a long distance from Mexico City to Istanbul. But um, oh, yeah. as, as a keynote speaker, you were talking right now about um, Metaverse. And I'm a member of MPI Mexico chapter, and we live on the presential uh, business. I mean, conference, congr congress, etc. So we are thinking about the Metaverse that is long time. R right now, as a meeting planner, we need to start thinking right now or, or let us to wait that something happened because you are more, more focused on the customer experience. So what is your opinion about that? Look, I, I think it really depends on what you understand as the metaverse. Uh, for me, the metaverse is not a place. It's not uh, something on Facebook or VR chat. The metaverse is what happens when you overlay a data layer about the digital world onto the real world. So it's very relevant, I think, for event planners today, because in the very near future, we'll have augmented reality glasses. Even the phones that we carry will provide more information about what's going on in the physical world. So really understanding the potential of those two worlds to collide in interesting ways, I think is really a challenge for all business leaders today. Got it, got it, thank you. Mike, what are the main characteristics that a leader must have in the face of uh, today's changes? Uh, it's a great question. It's really never been a more difficult time to be a leader, if you think about it. We just survived the pandemic, and now we have supply chain crisis, the great resignation, uh, talent shortages, inflation, cost of living crisis. So for me, the, the two essential skills are not only the ability to handle ambiguity and uncertainty and make decisions in that kind of environment, but the second is to be able to leverage emerging technologies, data, artificial intelligence, not as something to be feared, but to augment your capabilities as a leader. Those for me are the two essential skills in, as we go into the next 18 months. Talking about the all changes about the worldwide uh, what is the best way to adapt your company or our companies in the new reality? I mean, right now we are asking us ourselves if we need to work from Monday to Friday, need to be Monday <laughs> to Thursday hours in your home, home office, uh, digital in different places. What is your opinion about the companies to transform that? 
Well, uh, it's been a very difficult time, I think, for many organizations because uh, we used to have a long runway on, on disruptive change. So people used to like to hire people like me to talk about things and then they'd say we can do this in five to ten years. Uh, after the pandemic, we had to change everything at once. So now I think is really an interesting opportunity to ask ourselves, well, okay, what kind of business do we really want to be in? Uh, what things from the past do we want to bring back? What do we still want to change? And what what are some of the things that we've learned that we want to keep? So the best way I think to embrace this moment of change is radical immersion. This is not something that you can study on the internet or you can benchmark your competitors. This is a time where we have to embrace experimentation. Uh, we have to uh, try new things. We have to adopt new business models. And we have to make sure that the people in our organizations are really exposed to these new trends rather than just you know, reading about them. Mike, how do you drive innovation and transformation in the, in the business? Uh, for me, transformation really comes down to culture. And when I say culture, I don't mean uh, our shared values or uh, the, the mission statement of the organization. For me, culture is a kind of an operating system. Uh, it's like the software that our company runs on. And it, it governs how we interact, how we communicate, how we make decisions, how we collaborate. And it's probably the single most difficult thing to do is to make useful optimizations and changes to that cultural operating system. You can't steal someone else's code. You've got to find the things that are working in your organization and basically amplify those. So when you look at this, the organization, organizations that are successfully embracing transformation today, that's what the leaders are doing. They're focusing on culture. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have to rethink how and where we work. I mean, and we, uh, maybe we talked before about it, but it's maybe the place, because you have been talking about, don't try to do a benchmarking, just dive into the, to the uh, intelligence information or the data business, etc. So, what about your book? You because you are a, uh, you have a bestseller, uh, the uh, uh, algorithm leader about it. So what is going about your book? Even not trying to be in a spoiler because everybody needs to buy it. <laughs> but what is talking about it? Uh, you know, I, my book, The Algorithmic Leader: How to Be Smart When Machines Are Smarter Than You, came out in 2019. You know, just before the world ended. Uh, but in many ways, it was a good time because. Uh, I thought a lot of those ideas would take five to ten years to become relevant. They basically became relevant in three months. And I think the big learning from that book essentially was that we live in a new age. I call it the algorithmic age in which artificial intelligence, algorithms and automation are increasingly shaping the way that we deliver products and services to customers and how we run and design our organizations. So to be effective in this new environment, leaders need two very different sets of skills. On one side, they need a deep understanding of human complexity, uh, how to motivate teams, what, what is a great customer experience. But they also need a set of new skills around how to understand how to leverage technology and data and automation to augment their capacities. And really that calls for a different kind of leader. Uh, and if you think about the old type of leaders, I mean, take Microsoft, compare someone like Steve Ballmer, who was literally Bill Gates' football coach at, coach at college, yeah. to someone like Satya Nadella, who's, I guess, more like a philosopher. And it shows you how much we've changed in, in really just a short period of time. Mike, where is the future of work going? What do you think is going to happen with, with the work? Well, I, I can tell you one thing for certain. The future of work is not just remote work. Uh, everyone's talking about remote work because in some ways it's the most obvious symptom of how our world has changed in the last 18 months. But, but actually, remote work is just a very small part of a much bigger transformation that's going on in really the design of organizations themselves. Uh, this is something I talk about a lot, and I say there are five characteristics about the future 21st century organization, and they are mobility, autonomy, memory, objectivity, and velocity. Uh, and I think it's really by trying to understand how the the platforms that allow us to get things done are, are changing and how we are all becoming, in a sense, technology or software companies, even if you're a very traditional organization. It gives you a bit of a clue as to just how much is really changing when it comes to the future of work. 
Mike, uh, talking about artificial intelligence, I'm bringing it to the real life because it's a topic that everybody talks, but nobody understands that right now, to be honest. <laughs> How can we take advantage of them talking specifically in the meeting business? Uh, you're absolutely right. People don't spend enough time thinking about the practical implications of artificial intelligence. Uh, they wonder about whether or not their chatbot is going to become alive or whether they're going to talk to Alexa and Alexa is really going to be their kind of virtual friend or not. Uh, but there are very practical implications. So I, I see three big shifts as a result of AI. The first is the shift from the idea that we are selling products and services to we are building platforms. Secondly is the shift from transactions to creating experiences. And the third shift is the sh shift from data to decisions. So when you think about the meeting and, and event space, I think each of these are, are very important because, you know, as someone who creates an event, and events are not going to go away, even in the world of the metaverse or digital transformation, but it becomes more and more important to think about building platforms rather than one-off events, to making sure that you're leveraging technologies like AI and data and the metaverse to create more immersive experiences. And then finally, to making sure that the data that you're collecting is not just being collected for the sake of collecting data, it's actually being turned into automated decisions that allow you to get more scale, greater efficiency and higher levels of engagement. Uh, so when you look at that, uh, you know, I, I think there's going to be new kinds of roles in the meeting and event space about people who can really understand how to leverage those AI tools in this specific application. Mike, what is the best use of big data? Uh, data is, uh, has gone on an interesting journey in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, in, in the old days, we used to, you know, we used to think data was a cost. Your IT manager would always be t reminding you to delete your attachments, to shrink your inbox. Then data was the most valuable thing in the world. I, I don't know if you remember, I think it was the 10th anniversary of that famous Harvard Business Review article, the sexiest job of the future, the data scientist. I'm sure that article was, ri was written by a data scientist because uh, it's certainly not the sexiest job in the world. But where we're getting to now is what I mentioned before, which is that data in itself is useless unless it is operationalized into the design of your organization to facilitate and automate smarter decision making. So if you aren't putting your data into action on a daily basis to give you better insights, to increase your efficiency or allow you to be smarter, then it's really not being effectively collected. Mike, we have been talking about a lot of topic points, uh, mainly in the innovation and the changing. And you were saying right now that you are thinking that in the future, uh, remotely work is not going to happen, but it's going to maybe the hybrid. Uh, we, uh, we are in Mexico City, where at least 25 or 30 million <laughs> people around here. So our people, our, ourselves are thinking, do I have to take one hour or 45 minutes from point A to B? That's the question that we have been doing the last uh, two months in order to say, okay, we need to go to hybrid instead of work everybody yeah. in their home. So it's, I, I know that <laughs> there's not happening in Peru, or maybe not in Colombia or even Chile, I'm talking about Latin America, but have, have you thinking about that major cities that needs to be work in outside of the borders or different place, something like that? It's a, it's a very complicated question, actually. Uh, and, and, you know, at face value, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and I've been to Mexico City many times. It's a wonderful city, but the traffic I know is terrible. So to wake up in the morning and go from one screen at home, travel in the traffic for two hours to go to a screen at work, to then call your colleagues who are still at home on Zoom makes no sense. So the hybrid model is just as challenging, if not more challenging, than the purely remote model. But to me, this is really not the question of where people should be. The, the more difficult question is, are we ready to design an organization where we've designed an effective way of distributing decision making that doesn't rely on people's location? And it, that's actually a more difficult problem because a lot of Zoom meetings are useless. Um, it's people trying to coordinate themselves on things that could be much more effectively done, um, if not by email, then some kind of collaboration platform. So I think we need to go back to the beginning. Rather than asking where people are, 
we have to ask, how do we make decisions? How do we use automation more effectively to make sure the decisions we spend time on are the ones that human beings should actually be spending time on? And when people do get together, are we doing enough to really build culture and teamwork and collaboration? Remote or hybrid work is fantastic if you've been in an organization for a long time, you've worked with your colleagues for a long time, but if you're new to the organization, you don't have an existing network, you don't have a mentor, it can be very difficult and very alienating uh, for that new talent. Mike, what would be the three main uh, suggestions that you would do to a leader in this new world? Um, I, I would say uh, the three most important pieces of advice I would give is, number one, when you automate, elevate. So as you start to look for ways to use more technology, to be more efficient, to uh, eliminate some existing work tasks, don't get rid of your people. They've been with you for a long time. They've been very loyal. They understand your culture. Give them the skills and training that they need to be smarter, to adopt in this new world. The second piece of advice I would say is don't work, design work. And what I mean by that is your job in the future is not actually to do your job. It's to find ways to destroy your job. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but what I mean is if you spend every day thinking of smarter ways for your job to be done, that's actually the most valuable thing that any human being can do, even in a world of smarter machines. And the final piece of advice is something I mentioned before, embrace uncertainty. It's not going to go away. This time of chaos we live in now is basically going to be what the next decade is going to be like. The people that can thrive in this environment, that can learn to be more probabilistic, who can be comfortable with higher levels of uncertainty, who can use data uh, you know, to really improve their own odds of making better decisions, those are not only the people that are going to survive, they're going to be the leaders of the future. Okay, Mike. Um just we are ending our program today for 18 minutes that's the, the name in english but we are very thankful uh, francisco and myself to having you in this uh in this period about this join on us with your experience with your storytelling with all your experience thank you from uh mexico city to istanbul so we are finishing right now right francisco thank you very much mike muchas gracias amigos de Smart Speakers, MPI y Mundo Ejecutivo. Nos vemos en el próximo programa de 18 Minutos. Hasta luego.